This winter we have been walking uh, with King David in the Bible, man after God's own heart. And last week we came to the final momentous act of, of David's life before he died as he leads his nation on a, basically you'd call it a fundraising drive, yes? As he lays the foundation for the building of the great temple, which has been his lifelong dream. Rather than run from God after his great fall, David ran to God. He accepted the fallout. He ran back to God. You could say he failed forward into the arms of God, and the Lord enabled him to do one more significant thing for his kingdom before he died. But David left much more than the great temple. And, and, and there's something else we're going to talk about today that is really his legacy to us that we want to celebrate today. It's, a, it's been a blessing to God's people in every nation, in every age, for 3,000 years since David died, this thing that he has left us. And it's been a blessing to you and me, whether you realize it or not. And, and I think you know what we're talking about, don't you? We're talking about the Psalms, this collection of, of, of poems and prayers and songs that David largely was the one responsible to leave for us. The Psalms sit in the middle of our Bibles like a hinge holding it all together. How many of you have at some point in your life been in a place of despair or despondency and the words of faith which David put in the Psalms spoke to you and comforted you? How many of you have experienced that? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Or the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? David is named as the author. Anybody know how many psalms David wrote? 73. And he wrote others. There aren't titles for all the psalms. We know he wrote some of the others. And 25, at least 25 other psalms were written by by the people on his worship team, people that he personally trained. And, and so David is the one we have to thank for this, this wonderful gift that God has given to each one of us. And what we want to do this morning at the start of Holy Week is we want to tell the story of Jesus' journey to the cross exclusively using David's psalms. And then next week we're going to tell the story of the resurrection also using the Psalms as our primary source material. And you might be, be thinking to yourself, Pastor Bear, how can we use the Psalms to tell the story of Jesus because they were written 900 years before Jesus was born. How's that possible? Well, there's something else about David's Psalms that we haven't talked about in this series. Not only were the Psalms aids for prayer, not only are the Psalms useful to be a guide to help us worship, not only are the Psalms wonder, a wonderful consolation in times of trouble, but the Psalms of David, did you know this, are also a great catalog of prophecy that streaks across time like a, cop, uh, like a comet, pointing straight to Jesus. David was not only a shepherd and a musician, a worshiper and a warrior, a leader and a king. David was also one of the greatest prophets in the Bible's history. Jesus came right out and, and said that David wrote of him. I want to put a verse on the screen here from, from Luke chapter 24. Jesus said this to his disciples, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets in the Psalms must be fulfilled. Thus it is written that the Christ must suffer. And on the third day, rise from the dead. As the apostles then began to go out into the streets of Jerusalem and, and preach the gospel, they used Old Testament prophecy as evidence that what they were preaching was true. And in Peter's very first sermon, he speaks of David in this way. Look at this scripture from Acts. He says, being therefore a what? A prophet... And knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his own descendants on the throne, David foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ. And David then quotes from Psalm 16. So this morning I want to do two things. First of all, I want to share with you a list of more than a dozen of these specific psalm prophecies. And then at the end we're going to ask the question, so what? 
What does that mean for me? If these are indeed supernatural prophecies, what are the lessons that I should draw from that? Not only is it a fascinating subject, you just say the word prophecy and everybody leans forward. I think you're going to get all Nostradamus on us. We just saw Dune the other day and prophecy is at the heart of that story. Everybody's gaga about prophecy. Not only is it fascinating, though, but I believe it's a life-changing subject. So, first, let's prove the case that prophecy exists by getting everybody up to speed on, on what a number of these prophecies from the Psalms are. Consider this training time. You need to know some of these and be able to share them with people when you're witnessing with them. It's interesting. Luke tells uh, this sto- uh, the story of Jesus after the resurrection, and he's on a road to a village called Emmaus, walking alongside two of his disciples, and they don't recognize him. They still think Jesus is dead. And he says to them in the course of their conversation, he says to them these words. Next slide, please. He says, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And I have no doubt in this this little lecture that Jesus gave these disciples, I have no doubt that he shared some of these psalms with them. For most of these examples now, and we're going to give you 17 of them, that's why your note sheet's so long today, the, the prophecy, the psalm will be on the left, and we'll show you in the New Testament where it was fulfilled. So, get ready to marvel, get ready for your jaws to drop, get ready to write. Here we go, we're going to go through these. First one. First prophecy in the Psalms that we want to point out, is that the Messiah would come from the line of David. We've talked about this in the series here, how David wanted to build God the temple, and and God sent Nathan the prophet to David and said, no, you're not going to build God a house. He's going to build you a house. Your line is never going to end. In fact, your kingdom is going to go on forever, referring to the Messiah who would be born from him. Psalm 89 is, is, is part of that. Well, from that point on, for centuries, the Messiah was thought of by God's people as being a son of David. So in Matthew 21, we have this story of two blind men sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And the crowd rebuked them, told them to be silent, but they cried cried out all the more, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. So, that's the first prophecy. Let's look at the next one. In the Psalms, we learn that God calls him, the Messiah, his son. Psalm 2 is a messianic psalm. And David writes it, and he says this, I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage. We know this is messianic because David was never called son by God, and and David's rule never extended to all the nations. This is prophetic. A third prophecy. Next. Jesus, might seem small, but Jesus points this out. He's worshipped by children. Psalm 8, David wrote, Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength. The Hebrew word also means praise, because the idea is when we worship God, God strengthens us. You have established strength. Well, interestingly, in Jesus on that first Palm Sunday, enters the temple. And in Matthew 21, chief priests and the, and the religious leaders are watching as the children are crying out to Jesus in the temple, what we just sang, Hosanna to the son of David. And they were indignant. And they said to him, do you hear what they're saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies? You have prepared praise Jesus saying, I fulfilled Psalm 8, is what he's saying. Next, that the Messiah would be rejected by the religious leaders is in the psalm. We read this verse earlier as we worshiped from Psalm 118. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. So in Matthew 21, Jesus is having a debate with the religious leaders about who the Messiah should be. And Jesus says to them, have you never read the scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and this is the Lord's doing. It was marvelous in our eyes, and they knew that he was talking about them. 
Next, we learn that he was rejected, the Messiah would be rejected by the world's leaders. Psalm 2 again. Why do the nations rage? And the peoples plot in vain. The kings of the earth set themselves. And the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Well, it's interesting. The apostles, as they began to reach out into Jerusalem, came under pressure by the leaders. And they were arrested and they were beaten. And early on in Acts chapter 4, we read this story of how the church gathered together to pray in response to this opposition. And in their prayer, what do they do? They quote Psalm 2, seeing it as a prophecy of what they were experiencing. And when they heard it, when they heard the story of, of how the apostles were being, being rejected and oppressed, they lifted up their voices to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers have gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. Prophecy. We also find this out. Next slide. That the Messiah would be betrayed by a friend. Psalm 41, verse 9, David writes, Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. Now, interestingly, Jesus in John 13, in the story where he washes the disciples' feet, has just told them that one of them will betray him. Jesus then says this, I'm not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen. But the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I'm telling this now, before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe I am he. Next, he would die by crucifixion. This is from Psalm 22. Again, we read some of it today, and we're going to circle back to this in a moment. But Psalm 22, written by David. Did you hear the words that, we were, that were recited either? For dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have what? Pierced my hands and feet. Crucifixion would not be invented as a form of execution for four or five centuries. There was no, no form of suffering where your feet and your hands were pierced. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat. And, of course, this is the story of Jesus. When they came to the place of the skull, there they crucified him. This form of execution where they nail your hands and feet. And Jesus, after his resurrection, his hands and his feet are his calling guard. As he appears to them and says, see, see my hands and feet. It is I. Psalm 22 also says this, this next prophecy. There are a half dozen different prophecies in Psalm 22. That they would gamble for his clothes. Psalm 22, 18. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. John 19 tells us what, we've, what you probably already know about the crucifixion. The tunic Jesus wore was seamless, woven in one piece. So they said to one another, let's not tear it, but cast lots for it. This was to fulfill the scripture that says they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Another prophecy. He would be mocked as he died. Again, Psalm 22, all who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusted in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Matthew was remembering this when he wrote, the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. He trusts in God, let God deliver him now if he desires him. The robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Here's another interesting prophecy, foretold by the Psalms, that the Messiah would thirst and be given a sour drink, Psalm 69, 21. They gave me poison for food. And for my thirst, they gave me sour wine to drink. Psalm 22 talks about the thirst of the one who is suffering there. In John 19, 23, Jesus said from the cross, to fulfill scripture, I thirst. And a jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. Next, in his dying, not one of his bones would be broken. Psalm 34, 20. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is, is, is broken. 
in John 19, now Jesus has died. The Jews came to Pilate. They asked that the prisoner's legs would be broken. Why did, why did they ask for their legs to be broken? It seems like torture upon torture. Well, there's a reason for that. Crucifixion was not a quick death. It took you hours, hours to die. I mean, we're talking almost a full day. It had been six hours. Now, Jesus had died only because of the, the extent of the torture that had happened to him. But you understand why they break the legs. In crucifixion, you basically suffocate to death. And you push up on the cross so that you can breathe. Now you figure out the rest. In breaking the legs, they would not be able to push up. It would hasten death. But they came to Jesus and found that he had already died, fulfilling the psalm. He would feel forsaken by God. Next slide. As he died. Psalm 22, 1, verse 1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Of course, these are words that Jesus spoke from the cross right before he died. We'll talk more about these next prophecies next week, but one more slide, a couple more. He would rise from the dead. Foretold in the Psalms, Psalm 16, Therefore my heart is glad, my whole being rejoices, my, my flesh also dwells secure, for you will not abandon my soul to shale or let your Holy One see corruption. David's writing this. He's not writing about himself. He's writing about the Messiah. In Acts 2, in Peter's first sermon, God, God speaks through Peter and says, God raised him up the Messiah, loosening the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. The Messiah would also ascend to heaven. Psalm 110, verse 1, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Acts 2, 34, in the same sermon, Peter quotes David again, For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. A couple more. David recognized him as his Lord. We'll say more about this in a little bit as we talk about Psalm 22 and Psalm 110. Next one. The Messiah would be divine. The Messiah would be God on human earth. Psalm 45, another clearly messianic psalm, says, Your throne, O God, speaking to the Messiah, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is the scepter of uprightness. And Hebrews recognize this, that this is about the Messiah. But of the Son, David says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The Messiah would be divine. And finally, and this prophecy has yet to be fulfilled, the Messiah's rule would extend over the, all the earth. Psalm 2, verses 8 and 9, Ask of me, I will make the nations your heritage, the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a, a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. In Psalm 22, 27, we'll circle back to this beautiful scripture. We've quoted it several times in the series all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. So if all 16 prophecies up to this one have, have been fulfilled, clearly I think we can have confidence that this is going to happen as well. Pretty amazing stuff. Now, let's look at one of these psalms in detail, one that gets quoted many times in the list, Psalm 22. So you got your Bibles. We don't have any slides for this one, but I want you to look at this, this psalm and let's we read a portion of it earlier. You may not remember, but last year around Easter, we looked at Isaiah 53, and we called it the greatest prophecy in all of Scripture. Whenever you're struggling with doubt, whenever you wonder, is this Christianity thing tr true? And we all have moments like this. You've got to turn to Isaiah 53. It is, it is truly the greatest prophecy it will help you regain your equilibrium, as will Psalm 22. That's where I want you to turn now. If Isaiah 53 is the greatest prophecy, then Psalm 22 is right behind it. 
Now, at first glance, it sounds as if David is writing about himself because he's writing about a man being attacked by his enemies, and we all know David has had plenty of experience with that. And in verse 1, he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And if, if you know the story of Jesus' crucifixion, and we just showed you the slide, you remember that Jesus actually cried out these words from the cross. Now, that doesn't prove that Psalm 22 is messianic. Jesus could have just been remembering David's words, and it matched how he was feeling at the moment as he died. However, another possibility is David might have seen a vision of Christ dying on the cross, heard Jesus say those words in his vision, and it could be that he wrote the words in his psalm because it matched his mood. We're talking Twilight Zone stuff here. Are you with me on this? Next, David writes this. You have the Psalm 22 open. Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, I find no rest. And I'm sure that David felt like this so many times, hunted by Saul, betrayed by his own son, Absalom. But it's one of the things that's wonderful about reading the Psalms. I think you would agree with this. The Psalms give voice to the rawest emotions that you and I feel as we walk through life. The Psalms remind us, David reminds us, that it's okay to be honest with God. It's okay to just lay bare your heart. In fact, David will write it later. He'll tell, tell people in one, another psalm, pour out your soul to God. And that's what he's doing here. Then in verse 3, David summons his faith to rise up within him. This is another thing we do in prayer that David's taught us. Sometimes we talk to God in prayer, and then sometimes we've got to talk to ourselves and say, come on! you got to believe this. That's what David's doing in verse 3. He's reminding himself of the holiness of God. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. I love this. What do you do when you feel God forsaken? Well, first, you cry out to God. You pour out your soul. You just tell God how it is. But then... You start to call to mind what you know of God's faithfulness in your life. You start to think of all that He's done for you and all that He's done for His people and His faithfulness and His promises. That's what's do, what David is doing here. He's calling on himself to believe. But then he sinks back down again. Verse 6, but I am a worm and not man. Isn't this the spiritual life? trying to, to rise up to God, and then our sin and sorrows and struggle pulls us down again. I am a worm and not man, scorned by mankind, despised by people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. And in these words, we catch our first glimpse that David is writing about someone other than himself. He's experienced people rejecting him and mocking him. Of course he has, but not everyone. The way he's describing here, David's always had friends and allies. But this person he now describes is suffering absolutely alone. Verse 9, It's you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust in you at my mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth. And from my mother's womb, you've been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near and there is none to help. And the trouble he now goes on to describe is unlike anything that David has experienced. He still speaks in the first person, but this is not David going through this. This is how we know that this psalm is messianic. Because it points to Jesus. Verse 12. Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a pot's herd. My tongue sticks to, the, to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. The details here is spine-tingling. Is it not? David is describing 
Jesus Christ dying on the cross 900 years before it happened. There is no other explanation that makes sense here. And then suddenly, verse 21, David hints at a deliverance. It's very quick. Could it be a, a, a foreshadowing of the resurrection? I don't know, but in verse 22 now, he switches from the third first person to the third. I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. He could be thanking God for a generic deliverance here, but I believe that what is happening here is he is now speaking straight to the man that he saw suffering. You who fear the Lord, praise Him, all the offspring of Jacob. Glorify Him. Stand in awe of Him, all you offspring of Israel. Whatever this person has done through their suffering, whatever it is, should elicit awe and wonder from everyone who loves God. For He has not despised or abhorred the affliction of of the afflicted. He has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. Whoever has suffered affliction of any kind, I'm speaking to you in the room now, whatever you're going through right now, the Lord knows. He knows what you're suffering far more than you realize because he was afflicted also. And then, Somehow, some way, the suffering that this person has done will end up touching and blessing the entire earth. Verse 27, all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nation shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord. And he rules over the nations. So how did David come to write this psalm? Jesus tells us. Matthew 22, that David is in the Spirit. Jesus is debating with the Pharisees about the, the, the Messiah. And he asks them, whose son is he? Well, of course, they know the tradition that goes all the way, ba way back to, 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 to David. He would be a son of David, and they say that. And, and, then, and then Jesus, quoting Psalm 110, which is clearly another one of these messianic psalms, Jesus says to them, how is it then that David, in the Spirit, calls him Lord? Saying, the Lord said to my Lord. The Lord, God, said to my Lord, the Messiah, sit at my right hand. If then, Jesus says to the Pharisees, if then David calls him son, calls him Lord, how is he his son? Drop them like, because they have nothing to say about it. In the Spirit is how David received this. It kind of goes along with what Peter would say. Next, next slide. Peter told us this. No prophecy is ever produced by the will of man. David didn't make it up. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by, by whom? The Holy Spirit. And that's how David wrote this psalm. And I believe that, that David, just like Isaiah two centuries later when he wrote Isaiah 53, I believe that what happened here is that David was given a vision or a dream, or something he saw that God showed him Jesus on the cross. He's, he watched it as if a movie. And then through the Spirit that God had him weave what he saw into the psalm he was writing. And I'm sure David didn't understand the half of it. Isaiah was mystified by what he had written. The Bible even tells us that the angels... The angels themselves longed to, to, to know more about what these prophecies were pointing to. They couldn't even figure, figure it out. So to summarize, what are the features in Psalm 22 that lets us know that it's messianic? Well, the f first thing we said is that David is writing about something that he himself did not go through. Starts out, sounds like David's suffering, but then it just becomes this, this much larger thing. Notice, though, David does not start the psalm by saying, Here now is a, pro a prophecy of the coming king, the Messiah. Instead, what God does is he wraps the prophecy up, like a, kind of like a Christmas present. And it's woven and hidden within the psalm itself. Now, some psalms have so much detail that you have to be blind or stubborn to, to not see that it's talking about the Messiah. And so Psalms like 110, like 22, Psalm 2 is clearly Messianic. Psalm 45, 
straight out messianic prophecy. But then with many of the other prophecies, it's less obvious. The prophecies appear kind of like diamonds mixed in with the soil. That prophecy that the Messiah's bones would not be broken, that appears in Psalm 34, and you read through that, and it's, it's David. It's just another one of David's psalms. It, the bit about the bones not being broken doesn't quite seem to fit, but the Holy Spirit moved David to put it in there. It's like a clue. It's like a puzzle piece. And you put all the puzzle pieces together and then stand back and you see it. You see him. It's Jesus. Now, the way God has placed the prophecies in the Old Testament, I suppose that if someone was committed in their unbelief, if someone said, no way, no how is that Jesus? No way, no how am I going to become a Christian? I suppose that they could find a way to look at these prophecies and, and not see what is plainly there. I mean, the, the Jews have read Isaiah 53 for 2,000 years, and most yet do not see. Isaiah 53 is like a hammer between the eyeballs, but they refuse to see it. I've often struggled with this. A Christian philosopher named Stephen Evans wrote this, and I found, found this idea very helpful. I want to show you this quote. It's, uh, it's very useful when you're trying to think about this. Next slide. Stephen Evans writes, given God's desire for humans to flourish in a loving relationship with him, we would expect the evidence for God to be widely available. At the same time, since God wants the relationship that humans enjoy with him to be freely accepted, evidence for his existence would also be, what? Easily resistible. The evidence of biblical prophecy is overwhelming, but you're still going to have to take a step of faith to accept Jesus as your Lord. So, isn't that an interesting idea? I hope you find that helpful. Now we want to ask as we wrap up, so what? What are the lessons that we should draw from this? And I want to give you just a minute now on your note sheet. I want you all to, to put in your own answer to this. We've looked at the biblical material here for the last few minutes. What are some of the lessons that you're drawing out from this? Take a moment, just on your own in the bo bottom section of your note sheet there, and then, uh, then we'll turn the page, and I want to share with you four reasons from the Bible why prophecy matters. Just take a moment. Kevin, you want to come up and play the Jeopardy theme? or? Is this all just interesting material, or is there something useful in this that, that God wants you to take home today? Now that your pump is primed, let me share with you four lessons that the Bible hopes will take away from studying prophecy. Here's the first one. Biblical prophecy is an aid to evangelism. We've seen in the verses that we've showed how both Jesus and the apostles appealed to fulfilled prophecy as proof that what they were saying was true. And like we said earlier, there is a fascination with prophecy. It's in so many science fiction movies, The Matrix, remember Neo was the one foretold. Frodo in The Lord of the Rings was meant to have the ring. Dune 2, which I could not fully understand. <laughs> People either love it or like, what? <laughs> well, tell you what, because there's such a fascination with prophecy today, what an opportunity to is given us as followers of Christ to take people straight directly to the source. Oh, you, you think prophecy is interesting. You know where it comes from, you could say to them. Do you know it comes out of Christianity? And then show them Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22 and, and, and point out, do you know who that's talking about? And they'll, they'll say, if they know anything about the gospel, they'll say, oh, well, it's Jesus. Do you know when David wrote Psalm 22? When? 900 years before he was born. 
And so use it as an aid to evangelism. Here's a second reason why prophecy is useful. Prophecy is an encouragement and consolation in times when God seems distant. How many of us have ever felt the way Psalm 22 felt, the way Jesus felt from the cross, the way David felt when he wrote it, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? How, how many of you have ever felt forsaken by God, wondering where he's at? I mean, every one of us should, should raise our hand to that one. Well, what do you do in those times? When God doesn't seem close and you're even wondering if he's there, well, it's then that you call to mind these undeniable, unexplainable wonders that are in our faith. Like fulfilled prophecy, like the empty tomb, like the supremacy of Christ. Tell me, who on earth has ever been like Jesus Christ? Explain it to me. There's been no one like him. And as you call to mind these, these wonders of our, our faith, maybe in doing that, it'll give you enough strength to get through today and then the next day. And, and until the day comes, and it will come, when suddenly you'll realize, oh, I feel God again. He is near. Prophecy is, is good for that. The Bible says that, that we're to abide in three things on this side of heaven. Faith, hope, and love. Every day is not a Cirque du Soleil laser light show with Jesus. Faith, oftentimes, is the only thing that carries us through each day. So use something like prophecy to fan your faith into a blaze. Third, seeing these prophecies helps us understand the imprecatory psalms to which some of you are saying right now, impreca who? Impreca what? An imprecation... If you've read the Psalms, you know what we're talking about. If not, let me explain it to you. An imprecation is a, is a word that means this. Next slide, please. It means to call down judgment or calamity or a curse on your enemies or the enemies of God. Something along those lines. And there's another number of places in the Psalms. How many of you know what I'm talking about because you've read them? And, and David writes this way quite often where he just comes right out and he asks God to enter in judgment with his enemies. And he says some pretty harsh things when you first read them. You're like, holy guacamole, David. I'm presently trying to memorize Psalm 139. And it's a beautiful psalm. It begins, O Lord, you have searched me. You have known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. A few verses later, where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your, your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in shale, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me. A few verses later, I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Do you know the psalm? It's beautiful. It's so comforting. God is with us. And then you get toward the end of the psalm, and you're reading along, and you're enjoying it. And suddenly David writes this. Next slide. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O oh God. O oh, men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O oh Lord? Do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with a complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Okie dokie then, David. Tell us how you're feeling. <laughs> what are you supposed to do with this? Well, if all Scripture is the inspired Word of God and profitable for training us in righteousness, then you can't say, oh, well, that's the Old Testament. We don't have to deal with that. No, 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 no. How much of Scripture is the inspired Word of God? All of it. Now, obviously, there are very wrong ways to interpret this verse that can take you to some dark and ugly places. Would you agree with that? But there is a right way, believe it or not, to interpret what David has just written that actually fits right in with the gospel. I mean, why did Jesus die on the cross? Is it not because there is evil inside of us? Hmm? Absolutely there is. And that evil, left unchecked, unforgiven, unjudged, 
unleashed, that evil will destroy me, my family, and my part of the world if it's not dealt with. And because of that, evil is to be hated. Yes, there is a perfect, complete form of hatred of evil that exists. When we say Jesus died on the cross for my sins, this is what we're talking about. Jesus going face to face, mano a mano, with evil and my evil and defeating it. And one day, will not evil be swept out of God's good creation? A world without sin, if you can imagine it. Now, because of Jesus' death, there are two ways and two ways only to deal with the evil that is in us, either by judgment or repentance. You can choose judgment. Go on with your life. Ignore God. Play life by your own rules. And when the time comes for Jesus to come and sweep the world of its evil, guess what? You'll be swept away with it. You can choose that path. Or the evil in me can be removed by repentance. Since Jesus on the cross took my judgment, he, he took my hell, I come to him and I accept his forgiveness, his grace, his offer of a new beginning for my life where through his Holy Spirit in me, it's Jesus in me, he will now teach me and train me how to overcome the evil that is in me. You can choose that path. And I think that would be a far better path to choose. Do you not agree? See, we cannot look at the cross as awful as it is. You cannot look at Psalm 22 as awful as David described it and not realize that God hates evil, and I should too. Hmm? Not realize that God resists and opposes evil with every fiber of his holy being, and I should too. You cannot look at the cross and not realize that God longs for the day when evil will be no more. And I should long for that as well. See, understood properly, the imprecatory verses of the Psalms, that's what they're saying. Now, David probably is not the best messenger for this. Nor am I, or you. But I love what Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote about this. Check this quote out from one of my favorite authors. Can we then pray the imprecatory songs? Insofar as we are sinners and express evil thoughts in a prayer of vengeance, we dare not do so. But insofar as Christ is in us, the Christ who took all the vengeance of God upon himself, who himself suffered God's wrath that his enemies might go free. We too, as members of Christ, can remember to pray these psalms. I hope you find that helpful and useful as you think about these psalms. Finally, these prophecies for me confirm the incalculable treasure that we have been given in the Psalms. There's a reason the Bible tells us in several places, like Ephesians 5.18, be filled with the Spirit, address one another with what? Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. When we talk to each other, we should use psalms. My friends, to be strong in faith, what I see Paul saying is we've got to feast regularly and fill ourselves regularly with the Psalms. If you've never read the Psalms before, there's 150 of them. If you read five a day, you could read through them in a month. That would be a good strategy. If you've never read the Psalms before, say, I'm going to read through the Psalms this next month and just read five a day. Some are shorter, some are longer, some are really long. But read them. And then when you're done with that, that's a good start. Now start to return to them. I like to go to bed with one of the psalms I've been working on or reading a psalm before I go to bed. And when I wake up in the morning and, and I pour my coffee and I have my quiet time, and Janice and I usually have our quiet times sitting on either end of the couch, and she knows this, 
I start with a psalm. Whatever it is I'm trying to memorize or review a couple of, it just helps me to get into the Lord's presence in a very quick way. I've memorized 25 of them by now over the last five years, and it has enriched my prayer life and my worship life in an immeasurable way that I cannot describe for you. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, once again as we close, another quote. The Psalter, his name for the Psalms, is the prayer book of Jesus Christ in the truest sense of the word. He prayed the Psalter, and now it has become his prayer for all time. It is a great school of prayer. Let's hold up our, our Bibles or our phones, if that's what you're reading on, as we, as we close. Do you realize that we are holding in our hands hidden treasure? And if that is so, do you realize how rich you are?